Over the next four weeks, we're going to be focusing on a different facet of the Christmas story. And today, our focus is on the shepherds with this idea in mind. It was just a job until Jesus came. Now, when you read the two accounts of the birth of Christ in Matthew and Luke, it's apparent that, if you would, take your outline and write this first blank in, humility is the central theme of the Christmas story. As you read the Gospels, the New Testament, you'll find that Jesus Christ was perfect in every way. And what's remarkable is that even though He was perfect, He was humble. You know, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 that Christ was humble to the point that He even submitted to the death, the most cruelest death imaginable, death on a cross. Now, it's far more beneficial for us in the long run if we follow the example of Jesus and humble ourselves. But the reality is, is that pride is so prevalent and so deeply rooted within our fallen human nature that we have to be humbled. Now, several years ago, uh, I was listening to ESPN radio. I know that pastors are supposed to listen to Christian radio all the time, okay? But I want the other pastors here do, I don't, okay? In fact, I rarely ever listen to Christian radio. I was listening to ESPN radio, and Dan Patrick had a show that aired every day back then, and uh, I, I just loved, it, loved to listen to the show. Um, this particular day I was listening to the radio show. show. He had a guest on that um, kind of has his own flair for the dramatic and in fact, show his, show his picture. It was none other than the one and only Don King, a legendary fight promoter with his trademark haircut. He's the only guy in the world that sports hair like that. And anyway, they were talking about a fight that had recently taken place. And as is the custom with Don King in every interview, he invents about three new words to add to the English language that didn't exist before. And this particular interview... They were talking about one of his fighters who had entered the fight heavily favored and had gotten knocked out. And as Don was giving his take on it, he said that the fighter had came in overconfident and that he had gotten humblified. <laughs> now let me ask you this. Have you ever been humblified? You know, uh, when we're talking about being humblified, we're talking about doing something so incredibly stupid that when you look back on it, it just leaves you feeling kind of numb, kind of like the same feeling you get when you have a root canal at the dentist office. Well, if you happen to be one of those people who have never been humblified, fortunately we live in the age of the internet. We live in the age of YouTube. And from this website you can draw several examples of people who have been humblified. A few years ago, by the way, if you guys would, would, would stop sending me stupid stuff that makes me laugh and distracts, I would appreciate it because uh, somehow it's going to end up working its way into a sermon. One of you, and I can't remember who it was, but I have a sneaking suspicion it was Chuck Burnley, sent me this video on YouTube um, about a bullfighter in Spain. And evidently he had grown bored with the sport of a 3,000-pound animal who you've just ticked off chasing you trying to get out of his way. Now, how you could ever grow bored... In a sport like that, I don't know. But evidently he got bored of just plain old bullfighting, so he and his friends got together and they decided to change the rules of the game a little bit. So if you would show this next slide. They said, why don't we set his horns on fire and then let's see what happens. Now, I would like to think that if I was in the company of, of good friends, that one of my friends at least would say, wait a minute, Steve, this is a terribly bad idea. This is not going to turn out well no matter what happens. And I won't tell you what happens because some of you are, are, are going to want to watch the video and see. But it doesn't turn out well. You know, Jesus didn't have to be humblified. He humbled himself. And the whole story of Christmas, that of God becoming a man and dwelling among us, among us is about God the Son humbling himself. And in Luke's account, Luke chapter 2, we see humility demonstrated in three different ways. And what I want to do this morning is briefly touch on the first two and then spend most of our time focusing on the third, which involves the shepherds. If you would notice, first of all, number one, God uses humble parents. Now, if you have your Bibles open to this passage, you can stay there all morning long because I won't ask you to turn anyplace else. And let's unpack this Christmas story as told by Luke. In verse 1, in those days... 
The days we're talking about are the days of the Roman Empire. Historians have it pegged down to between about 6 and 4 B.C. that a decree went out. This is an imperial edict. Today we would call it an executive order. And when Caesar Augustus tells you to do something, then that means you better do it. It says a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Augustus has been regarded as the greatest emperor of Rome. He ruled Rome for 41 years, and under his rule, Rome reached the zenith of its power. It says that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now, in our country, we have a census about every 10 years. You know what it's like to sit down to a meal, eat and supper, and then they get a knock at the door, and some stranger's there, and they ask you how many people live in your house, and they're, they're counting for the census. Well, this census that Caesar dec uh, decreed wasn't that type of census. This was a census where the purpose was so you could pay taxes. It says this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. So you had to go back to the, the city that you were born in to register and, of course, pay the tax. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. It's here that we're introduced to a guy by the name of Joseph, a carpenter by trade, a hard-working, blue-collar kind of guy, probably drove a pickup, definitely drove a Ford, because we know that God would never want his son riding around in a Chevy, right? You know, it says that he went up, when in reality the direction that he was heading in was south. The reason Luke said that he went up is because the journey from Galilee to Bethlehem was uphill. 85 miles uphill on the back of a donkey in the summertime with a wife about ready to have child. Any of you men want to ride 85 miles uphill in the summertime with an expectant mother only to get there and be taxed? We need to give Joseph some credit here. He was quite a guy says that he went up because he was of the house and family of David. If you read Matthew chapter 1, you find the genealogy of Jesus. And we see that Matthew had traced his lineage all the way back to Abraham through King David. That would make the firstborn son of Mary and Joseph the rightful and legitimate heir to the throne of Israel. In order to register along with Mary who was engaged to him and was with child... Now. Socially speaking, this presented a big problem. You see, had Joseph wanted to, he could have brought an accusation of infidelity, which in those days, if found guilty, would have carried the death penalty. But he didn't. Joseph was willing to accept the rumors and the innuendos and allow people to draw their own conclusions because he knew the truth. You see, an angel had appeared to him and told him the truth. And we're not sure at all why Mary went with Joseph because in these types of censuses, uh, the wife was not required to travel with the husband. The only explanation would be that she understood the prophecy issued in Micah 5.2. It says, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. You see, Mary had been in the word of God and she understood that the child that she carried in her womb was the Messiah, and that hundreds of years earlier, a prophet had declared that this Messiah, this baby, must be born in Bethlehem, and she was merely being obedient to the Scriptures. What we have in Mary and Joseph are simple, ordinary, humble people, probably living from paycheck to paycheck. I can imagine Joseph setting up at night, after he's worked long, hot hours in the sun, trying to figure out how he's going to make ends meet, caring for his new bride and God's son. But when we read this story, we see that God's power flows best through empty, often broken vessels. God cannot use people who are filled with himself. God can only use people who have emptied themselves of themselves and who are filled with his spirit. Now notice, secondly, not only does God use humble people, but God uses a humble place. In verse 6, while they were there, that is, of course, the city of Bethlehem, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths. Literally, 
she swaddled him in strips of cloth. This was a custom in those days that would keep the child's limbs straight for a variety of reasons for their safety. And it says, and she laid him in a manger. Now, if you would, those of you who have been blessed with children, think back with me to the birth of your children. Remember what it was like when, you know, your wife had a baby and you were so excited about the coming of that little one and the day came for you to bring that child home from the hospital and you had a place that was all prepared. I know in our house it was, it was really exciting because our, our youngest actually was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and making that trip back and forth to the hospital every day made us really appreciate that day that finally came when we could bring him home. Who of us here who have gone through that and you look at the the fragileness of a young baby, of a newborn, and the vulnerability you know, of such a young child, who here of us would take that child and place them in a feeding trough used for livestock? Not a one of us. But you know, Christ being laid in a manger is consistent with the entire theme of the Christmas story. And that is that God uses the lowly and the lightly regarded things of this world to confound the mightiest not the high and mighty. If you are here today and you think highly of yourself, then you can rest assured that God doesn't. God thinks highly of those people who don't think very much of themselves at all. And the more success we experience and the more blessings we receive, the more careful we have to be about the toxic effects of pride upon our soul. Notice this next phrase. She laid him in a manger. Why? because there was no room for them in the end. Now, there are two villains in the Christmas story. The first one was Herod, and he deserves all the nasty things that have ever been said about him and more. He was a really bad guy. But then there's the innkeeper. You know, when the parts are handed out at the Christmas play, nobody wants to be the evil, old, stingy innkeeper that turned Mary and Joseph away, right? That's just not a good part to have. You know, maybe this isn't fair. Because when we say an inn, we're not talking about the Holiday Inn. Mary and Joseph didn't travel 85 miles and were turned away at a Fairfield Inn or a Holiday Inn. What Luke actually meant here was a caravan stopover. It was a place where traveling caravans could bed down for the night and find a little bit of safety. Now, in our culture, we would call it a truck stop. Now, I'm not demeaning the fine occupation of truck drivers. Some of the best men I've ever known were over-the-road truck drivers. But let's face it, truck stops are exactly that. It's a place where a truck stops to get fuel, a little bit of food, and then maybe spend a few hours at night. It certainly isn't the top list of places you would want your wife to have a baby, would it? Not in a truck stop. So now what we have is the great I Am of the Old Testament. We have the one that Isaiah called Wonderful Counselor, The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace is born to humble people in the most humble of places. Yes, the King of Kings has finally been born. Now, if you're God, how do you announce a birth that for thousands of years have been talked about by sages, prophets, and holy men? Someone has gone through the Old Testament and they've calculated that there are 353 specific prophecies concerning the Messiah in the Old Testament. This was a big event. You would think that God would have contacted the New York Times. You would think that God would have had on retainer the finest marketing firm in the world to announce the birth of His Son. But once again, God throws us a curveball. He uses it, number three, with a humble profession. He announces it using a humble profession. In verse number 8, it says, In the same region, that is on the hillside outside of Bethlehem, there are some blue-collar guys who was just doing their job, and they were shepherds. We have come to think of shepherds in a much more positive light because the Scriptures always paints them that way. After all, in the Gospels, Jesus told His disciples that He was the good shepherd. In Genesis, Abel was a shepherd who obeyed God and brought the proper sacrifice. Before Moses ever led the children of Israel out of Egypt and and through the wilderness, he was tending his father-in-law Jethro's flocks on the backside of the wilderness in Midian. And it was there, while he was a shepherd, that he encountered God in the burning bush. 
Before David was ever king, he was a shepherd. In fact, one of the reasons he gave Saul for allowing him to go and take on Goliath was that while he was watching his father's sheep one day, a lion and a bear attacked, and he had taken them on and taken them out. And he said, certainly I can do this with Goliath too because he's blasphemed our God. Later, David would pen the 23rd Psalm in which he said, the Lord is my shepherd. But even though we may think highly of shepherds today, the truth is people didn't think very much of them around the time of Christ's birth. It was a hard, dirty, dangerous job that required you to work the graveyard shift many times alone. On top of that, Shepherds were often accused of stealing because their herds would slip over and begin eating the grass on other people's lands that didn't belong to them, and so they were accused of being thieves. What I'm saying is it was not a career that young people aspired to. Let's read on about the shepherds. It says they were staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, you and I have grown accustomed to the nativity scenes that we've been seeing ever since we've been celebrating Christmas here in the West of Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds and the livestock and, of course, the baby Jesus huddled up in the, in the cold and they're shivering, about to freeze to death. Have you seen nativities like that? Of course you have. We hear songs about, you know, a child, a child, sleeping in the night, shivering in the cold. The reality is that's not the time of year that Jesus was born. Now, I'm sorry if that ruins your nativity scene at home. I understand the spirit we're trying to do with this. But the reality is that shepherds did not stay out with their flocks at night in the wintertime. They only did that during the warm months. In fact, scholars believe that Jesus was born sometime between March and November. In verse 9, the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. You have shepherds just clocked in, doing their job, getting ready, settling in for a long night, probably wondering how they came up so short in life as to end up in a dead-end job, when all of a sudden the mundane gets interrupted by the miraculous. An angel appears with the bright glory of God, and understandably, they were frightened. Now what I want to do now Let's focus on the three responses that the shepherds had. Write this first thing down. This is the first way they responded, is they heard. In verse 16, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. The angel looked at him and said, I know that you don't see an angel every day. I know this is something you've never experienced before. But I don't want you to be afraid because I've been sent from heaven to give you some good news. Now that term good news comes from the Greek word euangelion, which Christ's earliest followers would later adopt to mean the gospel. The message that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. So we're talking about I'm bringing you good news of great joy. These guys didn't have very much to be happy about in life. The angel said, guys, I've got some news for you that is going to change the way you look at life for all time. Now, what is joy? Joy is the assurance that you can have that in spite of your bad circumstances, because God is in control, everything is going to be all right. Joy is much different from happiness. You see, happiness is contingent upon outer circumstances, If everything is going okay around me, then I can be happy. But joy is something that you can have even when your world is crumbling down. If I could, let me illustrate using something in our state. If you would, look up on the screen at this river here. This is the Dismal River. It's located 88 miles northwest of North Platte, about 15 miles of the most beautiful city in the United States, Mullen, Nebraska. Now, I have fallen in love with this place so much that I plan on retiring there. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea how I'm going to afford it. But I plan on retiring there. In fact, I plan on being buried there. I've instructed my wife to bury me on the hillside overlooking another river north of town in a beautiful cemetery where the lots are really cheap. I mean, the lots are only about $300. In fact, 
I've already planned out my funeral. I want to have my funeral here at Calvary Community Church. And hopefully all of you will attend, right? And uh, when we have the funeral, I want my casket to be carried outside. And it has to be placed in the back of Craig Swanson's truck. That's how I want to go. And I want you to have a long funeral line all the way from here to North Platte. Go in there and then head northwest and bury me in that, right overlooking that river where I've spent so much time, and then I'll see you when Jesus comes back. Amen? Won't that be great? Then you got to go back to my favorite restaurant, Whiskey Creek in North Platte, and tell every stupid story I've ever done and laugh, your, and laugh until it hurts. That's how I want it to be. But I, I love this area. You know, years ago, a pastor, when I moved here, introduced me to this marvel of nature hidden in the sand hills. I've kayaked this river nine times with our youth group through the years. Most of the time, it takes about eight or nine hours to make it down this river because it is a very difficult river. It'll, it'll really test you and dry you. In fact, it'll, ask Terry Meyer, it will push you to the edge of psychosis at times. It's that difficult. But one year we did it with a group that had done it a couple of times and, and we got through in four or five hours. Now, Unlike other rivers, which depend upon snowfall or snow melt and rainfall to keep its levels up, if you do the Niobrara River in late summer, particularly during a drought, you might as well hike because you're going to be dragging along the bottom so much it's not even worth getting in the boat. I've done that. It is, a, it is awful. But the Dismal River is different because its water levels are sustained by a source deep underground. We know that source as the Ogallala Aquifer, a vast ocean of water that rests underneath a lot of the Midwestern states, particularly in Nebraska, and it keeps the levels of the Dismal River pretty much stable. Now, the levels will go up during a rainstorm. They will go up in early spring due to snow melt back west, but they never go below a certain point because it is sustained by a water source much greater than itself. Now, after you've kayaked on the Dismal River for about three hours, you'll come to this phenomenon. This here is, if you show that next slide, this is a little spring here. And uh, as you're paddling along, you look off to the left, and there's a little pool of water that you think is about an inch deep. And as you step out of your kayak, thinking you're going to, you know, take a break, you will immediately sink through that sand up to your neck. But before you go any lower... The force of that spring that geologists really can't explain is so strong coming up out of the bottom that it immediately shoots you back up and you're going to be at a level at about your chest and you can't go any further. Even if you try, it's difficult to go further. Now, as fun as that may be, bear in mind that you are in the sand hills and this spring is shooting sand up into your shorts. So when you get back into the kayak, just be prepared. It's not going to be very nice. But you know... The worst drought can only lower the level of this river so much because it is sustained by something far greater than what you could ever see. And that night on the hillside, the angel told these hardworking, underpaid, underappreciated guys, I am bringing you good news, news that will bring you everlasting joy, news that will help you go through the day-to-day -day difficulties and the hardships and the empty pockets and the broken hearts. I bring you good news. But notice this, the angel said it's not just joy, it's great joy. The Greek word there is megas, which means I'm bringing you mega joy, which will be for all the people. If you have a Bible, underline those three words, all the people. If you were a shepherd, you weren't included in the majority. You were used to being overlooked and looked down upon. The angel said, the news I'm about to share with you is for everybody. For today in the city of David, there has been born, now take your pen and underline these next two words, for you. You know, I've had the privilege the last couple of weeks of having my mother come up uh, for Thanksgiving and just what a blessing it is to be around her and I really spent a lot of time with my mother because obviously she's getting up in years and she's in good health, but this time we really spent an awful lot of time together. Took her to lunch a lot of times and just listened to her. She's been a widow for 20 years. My father passed away, you know, suddenly 20 years ago and uh, 
you know, all her grandkids are grown now, so she spends a lot of time alone, and I, I knew she was really looking forward to this trip. And while I was there, I told her, I said, Mom, no matter how hard I try, I just can't ever seem to make Christmas at our house nearly as good as you and Dad were able to do for us. You know, no matter the money we spend or the different things we try, it just doesn't quite seem to measure up to what I remember as a kid. We'd put the Christmas tree up, usually around our house, the night the Heisman Trophy was awarded. Somehow, everything in our house always revolved around football. And the night the Heisman Trophy was being awarded, that's when we had the decorations out, and we were putting the tree up, and then, you know, Mother would decorate the inside. Now, Dad would decorate the outside a little bit, but not nearly to the extent that some folks do. And then we would see the presents start to appear under the tree, little by little as Mom got her shopping done. But it all culminated in the night of Christmas Eve when my uncle would come down from Atlanta and he was taking care of my grandmother and he would bring my grandmother. And some years ago, my uncle decided that he had a favorite niece and nephew and it would be myself and my sister. So my sister and myself, we'd look in the window as my uncle would get out of the car and he'd go around, he'd pop the trunk, and then he would make several trips back and forth up and down the driveway. You know why? He had presents for everybody, but especially for my sister and I. And my uncle was a great uncle. I mean, he was the best. He always had big presents. And he'd put them under the tree, and we could hardly eat our supper without taking our eyes off those big presents that were under the tree that had our name on it. Now that night, heaven sent a messenger to the hillside outside of Bethlehem to let these guys know that they were loved. The angel said, there's a gift for all people, but especially for you, wrapped in a manger with your name on it. Now the angel here is going to use three different titles to describe the identity of the gift in the manger. Look at your Bibles. The first title, he says, there has been born for you a Savior. Throughout Israel's history, God had frequently sent warriors, great leaders, to defeat Israel's enemies. In Egypt, he sent Moses to defeat Pharaoh. When they entered Canaan, a hero named Joshua led them into battle and conquered their foes. Later, in the time of the judges, men like Samson would defeat the Philistines. In our time, God has sent a deliverer to Nebraska, Scott Frost, (laughs) right? To bring us out of the darkness that our program has been in. But you know, these great heroes of the Bible, they could be considered saviors in that they defeated Israel's enemy. But what the angel said was, a savior has been born, meaning that he will save you from your ultimate enemies of the devil and death. Not only was he a savior, the second phrase is, it is Christ. This is the word Christos, which means the anointed one or the promised king who would sit on Israel's throne. No king had sat on the throne of Israel since Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., during which time they had been ruled by the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the, uh, the Greeks, and now the Romans. But now, as it just would happen, in the city where their greatest king David had been born an even greater king is born. And he's not only going to bring peace to the nation, he's going to bring peace to the entire world and allow men to make peace with God. So you have a Savior, Christ, the the third term is the Lord, and this is the title that Luke most often used to refer to Jesus. It refers to the holy, personal, unspeakable name of God himself. The angel said, make no mistake about it, what's lying in the manger is your Savior. He is the anointed King of Israel, but He's also God Himself. You see, God will live among men. The Creator has stepped right into the middle of His creation. And it says, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. They didn't ask for a sign, but Jews were known to ask for such things. So the angel said, here's the sign. Go to Bethlehem, you're going to find a baby wrapped up, swaddled, lying in a manger. And suddenly they appeared with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. You have an entire angelic symphony now erupt all across the heavens 
giving glory to God. Why? Because for thousands of years, there had been a gap between men and God. Man and God had been separated because of sin. And now the solution to sin has now been born. Jesus Christ. And man can be at peace with God. Not only did they hear the message, but write this down, they obeyed. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. These guys didn't procrastinate. The scriptures don't even tell us that they called and got some substitutes to come in and watch their flocks while they left. In all likelihood, they were so overwhelmed by the moment and they realized that what had happened in Bethlehem was a can't-miss event that even if they lost their flocks, their livelihoods, even their jobs, it was a sacrifice well worth making because Jesus and His birth deserved the top priority. Let me ask you this question. In the hustle and bustle of our lives and the busy schedules that we all have, do we find ourselves often too busy for God? Do we find ourselves so distracted by the different things in our culture and our society that even though, yeah, we're okay with God and we think God's a great idea, we don't make Him the priority that He should be? You know, there's so many things that happen on Sunday morning that can pull you out of church, but the shepherds left their jobs to go and worship the King of Kings without any thought of what might have happened. They realized whatever may happen, we know where our place is right now, and that place is in Bethlehem beside that manger. You know, you just don't have to wait till Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 10.30 to worship God. You, you, we're, we're to worship God 24-7. And you can meet God every day in the Word of God and in prayer. Those are the two essential elements of building a personal relationship with God. But I know in my own life, how many times at night do I become distracted and I do not give the King of Kings the time that He deserves? So they came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as He lay in a manger. Notice with me last of all, they shared. Verse 17, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had told them about this child. That is, when they had seen what the angel had told them to go see, which was the, the baby Jesus in the manger, these guys couldn't help but go share it. And they went out and they began to tell everybody that a baby has been born, but not just any baby. This baby is the Savior who will defeat the devil and death. He is the Christ, the anointed one, the legitimate heir to David's throne. Not only David's throne, but he also is the king of kings. And he's also the very Lord God dwelling among us. And because of him, we can have peace. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. You see, for these shepherds, it simply was a job until Jesus came. But when He came, their entire life took on new meaning and purpose. And later they would return to the hillside, but they would never be the same again. Now the powerful truth of the Christmas message is this. Bethlehem was the place where the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. And that's the message the shepherds heard that night on the hillside. And they obeyed. And then it so changed their life that they couldn't help but go out and tell other people about it. Let me ask you this question. Have you grasped the reality that God loves you so much that he entered this world as a vulnerable baby, as a helpless child, so that you could have peace with God? Have you allowed that truth to change your life in such a way that you're excited about it, that you're willing to share and tell it to other people? I pray you have. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful season of the year. A season, Lord, when 
we seem to be focused on giving and receiving gifts. God, how we pray that we would not neglect the greatest gift of all, which is your gift of eternal life, bought and paid for by your precious Son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate. Heavenly Father, I pray that there's someone here today and they need to receive this gift, that today they would pray and they would receive you as their Savior. Lord, for those of us who have received that gift, Lord, grow in us an excitement to tell other people. These things we pray in your name. Amen.